his name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we're back on track tonight with being Baptist distinctives that matter. And tonight we're going to be talking about an interesting one that oftentimes churches just will not touch at times, and that's church discipline. And we're going to be looking at the scriptures to see what they say about it. But let me ask you this question. You ever seen someone that might have something off with them? Maybe that morning they uh, uh, were getting ready, and maybe they've got some fuzz on their shirt, or maybe you see someone that you're out, or maybe it's a man, he's got his collar flipped up on one side. I know sometimes I've been going somewhere and I've had my tie on and flipped my collar down and didn't get it down enough and it's kind of up my neck toward my ears and someone comes up to me and says hey brother won't you fix this because uh, maybe you didn't notice that but um, maybe a misaligned button something just looks amiss on someone but let me ask you what makes it so hard to tell someone that there's something off with them what makes it so difficult? Why do you think it's such a difficult thing to do? Any, any reason? It embarrasses them, yeah. You're afraid to offend them, and you just don't want to say something that's going to make them feel odd or just feel indifferent. Well, today's lesson obviously is about church discipline, and part of the process of doing church discipline means that you have to confront people. That's not an easy thing to do. Uh, when you have to confront someone, it's possibly over something that is controversial, that they may see is not wrong, that you see that is wrong. So it's a, it's a very hard thing to balance because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That's the world we live in today. People just don't want to hurt people's feelings. Um, Sadly to say, that's the world that we exist in today, and that's why we've got a big mess on our hands, is that people tiptoe around individuals and they walk on eggshells. They just don't want to bother others. But in the previous two lessons, now obviously we were off last week, but the previous two lessons that we talked about were pertaining to a central theme of pure church membership. And pure church membership is literally meaning that you are a committed member of a church, that you are a healthy member uh, within a church. And we talked about the requirements for that is regenerate membership, meaning that someone can only join a local body of believers if they have been saved, genuinely saved, and Jesus Christ has saved their soul. And also, being a baptized member, meaning that if you're saved, you are to be scripturally baptized. And that means that you walk in obedience to Jesus and you have been baptized, which we believe is baptizing. That's the Greek for baptism. And that is by full immersion. That's what we believe as Baptists to be the method for baptism. Now, today we're going to be talking about church discipline. But then next week we're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper. And that's actually interesting because we're doing the Lord's Supper Sunday and then we'll be studying more about it uh, next Wednesday. But I've got a little funny clip here I want to show you. Hopefully we was able to get that comic strip up there. Okay, all right. All right. It says this. First I told you privately. Now I'm here with a brother as the scripture says. But Henry, if you don't stop adjusting the thermostat, we're bringing you before the whole church. <laughs> little comic strip here about obviously the thermostat in the church and oftentimes we have a difference of opinion on that but church membership like I had spoke to you about earlier in another lesson is a covenant relationship in which members strive to encourage each other they exhort one another um, and oftentimes that means to confront others, especially if one has fallen away or is living in sin. That's something that we commit to each other. That if we are a pure church member, that we are healthy in our church membership, we commit to confronting each other in love. So that's an important thing to recognize, in love. You just don't confront someone 
just because you want to make a fool out of them or you want to bring something to light just to make a mockery of that person. No, you do it in love, praying that there is correction. And you want that person to do right in the eyes of the Lord. And so that's what we see here with um, church discipline. Now, the New Testament gives us instructions on how to conduct church discipline in a manner that helps restore the sinning, offended member in the correct way. So tonight, I want us to look at a couple things here, and hopefully we'll be able to get as much in as we can. But first of all, let's look at the church and how it expects members to grow. Now, when people are regenerated, they receive new life. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that when I was lost and Jesus saved me, I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. There was a new path to walk, a new path to follow. They're changed. They're changed for all eternity. Now, while a person does not obtain sinless perfection until we stand in the presence of their Lord, we do begin the process of sanctification. And that's an important thing to talk about. Let's look at what it says here in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, what does the name new creature tell us about ourselves as believers? That's right. We're not the same. We are new. We are not the old. We have become new. Now let's look at Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What is the believer's rational response to salvation? Well, when you become saved, what happens? You become a living sacrifice. You become a servant. You serve the Lord with all of your heart. And who wouldn't want to do that self, do that for the Lord after being delivered from the penalty of sin? And that's the logical action to take. Um, so a spiritual transformation needs to take place over time. And that's what is meant by sanctification. Now, here's what sanctification is. Means The sanctification process is not a matter of human effort or willpower. Well, rather, it continues as believers are progressively transformed by the renewing of their minds. Romans 12, 2, that tells us this. By God's grace and through the power of the Spirit. So sanctification is actually a process that takes place after the person becomes a Christian. It's a steady process, and it must be one that moves forward as you continue to grow. Now let's read a couple of verses here, then I've got a question to ask you. And as we read, well, let me go ahead and ask you this question, and then you can kind of think of the answer. As we read these verses, think of this. What are the catalysts for a renewed mind? Now here's the first verse. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then Hebrews 10, 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And then Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what are the catalysts for a renewed mind according to what these Scripture verses say? Does anything stand out to you? The Word of God? What else? The fellowship? Anything else? The Holy Spirit? Anything else? You said fellowship. I also like... Absolutely, that's a good one. With the fellowship part, I was thinking too about the encouraging and exhorting ministry of fellow church members. To exhort, encourage, that's all part of that. See, there's no shortcut to sanctification. Um, you ever heard someone say, especially when they're wanting to get something done, I just need that magic pill. If I can only swallow that magic pill, it'll take care of all my problems. Well, see, there's no magic pill to swallow or secret prayer to utter for the shortcut to sanctification. There's no shortcut. 
It is a lifelong process. It is a process as you continue to grow. It takes daily exposure to God's word, dependence on the spirit, and genuine fellowship with a body of believers. And that's why it's so important to be a part of a fellowship of believers so that you can grow and that you can grow and, and also grow through the process of sanctification. So first of all, the church expects members to grow. Secondly, the church disciplines erring members. Now, we talked about Baptists believe in regenerated church membership. Now, to join a Baptist church, we know that the members that are prospective must first be able to articulate a credible profession of faith in the gospel. And what that means is, and what we've talked about with pure church membership, uh, Baptists do not mean that church members must be living a sinless, perfect life. But what they mean is that they must not permit its members to return to the sinful ways of living that characterize the unsaved. Meaning that we cannot just allow someone to slip through the cracks and fall back into their old ways or fall into the ways of the, Lord, of, of the world. See, if a believer persists in scandalous conduct, the church must challenge that. They must do everything they can to reach out to see that that person is restored. That's a must. Um, if that person, he or she, will not respond, the church will disfellowship them. This is known as church discipline. And I'm telling you, that's a, it's a hard thing. Um, I've not seen many churches in my life practice it. I think I may have shared this story once before. I'm going to save it till a little later. But um, I've only seen one case where a person has been disfellowshipped from a church and then later joined back to fellowship. And uh, I'll share that story. I think I may have shared it once, but it's important to share it here tonight. And I'll do that here in a little while as it pertains to the topic that we're on. But church discipline is any activity by which church members hold one another accountable for growing as disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, church discipline may include informal instruction, encouragement, or rebuke. It may also include more formal steps when a church member persists in conduct incompatible with the gospel. Now, there are two passages of Scripture that deal with the instruction on handling different types of church discipline. There's two passages of Scripture. Uh, we're going to first look at this for personal offenses. We're going to look at this one first. Uh, private grievances between church members may eventually lead to public church discipline. Now, one of the key texts for understanding how to deal with things in a private manner comes from what Jesus said in Matthew 18. Let's read verses 15 through 20. It says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect, shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and publicly. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, Jesus is speaking here in this passage of Scripture. And in this passage that he is speaking here, we see that there is a brother that has committed a private sin. A sin known only to another brother. Now, it most likely involves uh, some type of trans uh, aggression that was committed personally against that brother. We're not really for sure, but it was against that other brother. That's what happens here within this passage. And this passage outlines four steps that the aggrieved party should take to reclaim the offending brother for the Lord. And this is the same way that we should handle it as well. Number one is this, to confront the erring person privately about 
this sin. Now, in some instances, a private exhortation will be adequate. You always pray for that. Please, Lord. (laughs) If I go to this person that has offended me, and I go and talk to them, I pray that it is settled there and then, and that we can shake hands, we can hug neck, and we can walk away knowing that this has been completely taken care of, and we don't have to discuss it any longer. That would be good. Look at what it says here in Matthew eighteen fifteen again. It says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. You know what that tells me? It tells me that if he's or she has done something to offend you, you don't run to somebody else and tell them about it and try to get them involved before you go talk to him or her. You need to settle it, if you can, by that first, by going and talking to them. Because if not, you're not following the biblical model that Jesus has set for us. Um. What are some sinful responses the offended believer could have? Gossip. Run to someone and say, can you believe what they did to me? They hurt me. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, go talk to them. Try to get it settled. Try to get it taken care of. Retaliate. Oftentimes we think the world tells us that if someone hurts you, you hurt them back. How can I retaliate? That's oftentimes a way that we possibly could respond. Become bitter or just have an angry tirade. Just get upset. Try to treat people differently. Try to treat them with anger. But first of all, though, he tells us, confront the erring person privately about this sin. That's the biblical model for how we're to handle it. Secondly, if the erring person does not repent, and change their ways after they've been confronted, the offended person is to confront him or her again as the second step. Now, this time, this confrontation is to take place before one or two witnesses. Um, The witnesses are for the purpose of observing and verifying what is said by both parties. Um, That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Let's look at verse number 16 again. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So if the person doesn't reconcile, if the person doesn't see their heir, then you bring one or two with you and their witnesses to hear both sides and to follow through with it. However, if that doesn't work, then we go to step three. If the sinning person does not hear the witnesses, then take the matter to the entire church. Let's read verse number 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now, at this point, the problem becomes a public affair because everyone is aware of it. The whole family is aware of it. You know, when you got sometimes sibling issues and mama has to step in and settle the deal. Um, Ever heard of that in families before? Well, in this situation, it's made public before the family and then the church is going to settle it there about what is to happen. This is the biblical model. Now, in the nature of the case, going before the church entails a more formal procedure than the previous confrontations. And Jesus' words in Matthew 18 assume that the both brothers appear before the assembly. Now, after hearing the entire matter, the assembly must decide. It must determine whether the brother has indeed sinned. And if so, it must decide what genuine repentance should look like. And this is Jesus' words here. So in bringing the matter to the church, both brothers are in principle submitting themselves to the authority of the local congregation. See, that's what you do when you come and become a part of a Bible-believing church is that you submit yourself to that congregation and you submit to that authority, meaning that we hold each other accountable. You're holding me accountable, I'm holding you accountable. So it's, it's a two-way part there that we hold each other accountable in that aspect. 
If that doesn't work, number four, disfellowshipping the erring person if they will not hear the church. Jesus anticipated a situation in which the sinning brother would not hear the church. So what does he say here in verse number 17? Jesus gives clear instruction. And if he shall not neglect to hear them, tell another church. But if he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now this is interesting because if you look back at Jewish culture, you look back at the time of the Israelites, within the community of Israel, Gentiles were known as the heathens. They were reckoned as outsiders and tax collectors. Publicans were accounted as renegades during this time. So this is the reason Jesus makes this comment here. Jesus' words imply that a complete break must take place in the covenant relationship between the sinning brother and the congregation. We never hope it gets to that part. You never do. And to be quite frank with you tonight, I have only seen one occasion, like I mentioned earlier, in my life where this has ever happened. And I'm going to share it with you right now. I think I've shared it before, but I'm going to share it again because this is important to hear because it was a bad thing, but then it ended being a good thing. So listen to this. The reason why I say this, I told you before, I share stories only of people that have gone on to be with the Lord. So if they got anything to take up with me, I guess we'll have to settle that one day when we're around the throne. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, there was a woman, and she was married to the pastor of this church, and uh, her husband had passed away. And she caused a really just nasty deal within the church after her husband died. She was bitter. She was angry. They couldn't do anything. They tried to get new people in there to lead the church. She just was mad bitter. Now, some time passed, and they tried to be very just um, warming towards her, just try to love on her as much as they could, but she was really hindering the growth of the church. They did the process. They went and talked to her. She wouldn't listen. They brought somebody with her to talk to her. She still wouldn't listen. Brought it before the church to talk to her. She wouldn't listen. So finally, they just had to ask her to leave. They said, you are causing a lot of problem, gossip, and it's really just hurting the church. She left. Well, I I served there at the church probably about around 2000, 2001, and uh, I didn't know who she was, but she had married, after her husband died, she had married, before I came, a gentleman in the church his wife had just passed away and he was a deacon of the church well they married and started coming back and some people had told me that she came back and didn't know how people are going to handle it obviously it had been a long time since that had happened so there's a lot of change in the church with who was there so I got to know her was a really sweet woman and one Sunday her and her husband just came up to the front of the church and he was standing there supporting her she stood before the church and shared that story about how that that had happened all those years ago. And she broke down. And she pleaded and she said, will you forgive me? I would never seen anything like that before where church discipline had occurred and then someone came back. She cried. She told them she was sorry. And she asked them, would you forgive me? I did wrong. They forgave her. She came back to be a part of that church. Um, Her and her husband both have gone on to be with the Lord. But I'll tell you, I will never forget that story. See, church discipline is not always a bad thing. It's not always a negative thing. It has to happen at times, especially if you've got someone that's causing problems in the church and they won't listen. You, You have to take matters because you have to think what's best for the church. Because this is a local body of of believers here. And we have a responsibility here to make for certain that what is being taught is right. It's sound with the scriptures. What we do here is right. And that always the message of Jesus is proclaimed loud and clear for this lost and dying world to hear. We must make sure those things are always done. However, at times you do have situations where you have to handle things like that. 
But who knows, later down the road, that person may come to a realization of knowing their error and their ways and be restored. Um, not all stories end like that, but I'll never forget that one. That was a really neat one, and uh, I'll never forget it. And I've shared that many times of how that's happened. But in this situation, though, Jesus' words imply that a complete break must take place. The person is no longer to be recognized as a part of the assembly. They are no longer counted as a member of the church. And this is important. This is the only procedure that the New Testament prescribes for meditating personal offenses between church members. It's the only place. Taking such offenses into the civil courts is actually strictly forbidden. Let's look at what it says here in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that have pertained to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren. But brother, goeth the law with brother, and that thou before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye do go to law with one another. Why do ye not rake, take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that taking offenses into the civil courts is strictly forbidden. This isn't the way to handle it. You don't just get mad at someone and then take it to the courts. You're supposed to work things out. Try your best to do that. And this is what he's talking about in this manner. So we've looked here at the, the personal offenses. Let's look at the public offenses and what takes place. When dealing with public offenses, and especially offenses of a scandalous nature, 1 Corinthians 5 is the crucial text when we look at how to deal with a public offense. Now, Let's look at the church's response. This is in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13. The immediate situation that's going on here in Corinth was that a church member had entered a sexual liaison with his father's wife, possibly his stepmother. I know it sounds awkward, but this is what it tells us here and what happened. This is according to 1 Corinthians 5, 1. It is reported commonly that there's fornication among you and such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles uh, that one should have his father's wife. So Paul was deeply indignant that the church would allow this conduct to remain unchallenged. They're not challenging this. And so he says here, and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that ye have done this deed might be taken away from among you. And then we see here, let's go ahead and read uh, throughout 13 here. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged readily, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such as one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven... Leaven leaveneth up the whole hump. Lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the steadfast, the feast, excuse me, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you an epistle not to comply company with fornicators, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covenants, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is a called a brother be a fornicator, or covenants, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such as one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now, 
How should a church respond when a member becomes embroiled in a public scandal? That sometimes can be hard to answer. Um, what happens when someone within the church, and I've seen this happen before, a member comes forward and says that I'm involved in a same-sex relationship? What do you do in that situation? How, how would the church handle that? How would you handle it if a person was involved in the church and they were having an affair with someone else in the church or another person outside the church? How do you deal with those situations? When reading these verses, some Christians have understood this to imply a practice called shunning. You ever heard of shunning before? You know what that means? It literally just means that you completely do away with and you just alienate them. You, you say that you're gone, you're done away with. However, most likely the text does not require a complete shunning of the offending party. But what it clearly does require is the cessation both of the privileges of church membership and of any form of interaction that could be construed as Christian fellowship. And this is the treatment Jesus was talking about in Matthew 8, 17, 18, 17, where he says, Let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So basically, if someone's involved with this and they're teaching or if they're leading music or if they're a pastor somewhere and they're involved in something, they immediately ought to step down. Immediately ought to go to the side if something like that were to occur. And oftentimes... You're going to make people mad. <laughs> you are because um, some people, when they get into their mindset and Satan has really fooled them, they think their way is okay. And that's very unfortunate. And so it's not an easy thing to do. But let's look at the church's goals here. This final step of church discipline is so important. See, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul touched on at least four goals of the, disis uh, of the discipline process. So let's look at those. And there's a little, um, maybe a display there if Stephen was able to get that one. I'm not for sure. I got that one to him late. But first of all is this. Preserve the church's testimony regarding sin. See, the offending member in Corinth was engaged in conduct that was no so much as named among the Gentiles. So, here's what I was talking about. Maybe it's on your piece of paper there. There's steps of church discipline for personal offenses, and then you see the goals of church discipline for public offenses, and this is where we're at here. But it's important that we recognize to preserve the church's testimony regarding sin. See, it's well known here in what Paul is writing that even the Gentiles, the heathen that were here, they were a little caught off guard about how this was going and how this was being done. So evidently, the unsaved community was scandalized by this man's behavior. So if the lost world has a problem and sees something's odd, but the church doesn't, there's something wrong with that picture. Because <laughs> our lives as Christians, when we live it, the world ought to look at our lives and think something's different in a good way. See, when you respond to situations and they see you acting differently, that should make them think. See, the church's reputation was being damaged and its testimony harmed. See, that's why that we as Christians and as a church need to take a solid stand against sin. That's why it's important. Remember what happened in Joshua chapter 7? Remember that story of Achan? Remember when he brought back what God told him not to brought? And the whole entire camp suffered? When sin gets in the church, when the devil gets in the church, everybody suffers. If sin is allowed to go on and on and on and on, everybody will suffer. And the testimony of the church can be hurt because of that. So that's why it's important to preserve the church's testimony regarding sin. And this is what Paul is writing here about to them. Saying, why hasn't this been taken care of? What's going on here? Number two is restore the offending brother. Paul said that the church was to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That's very powerful what it says here in 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 5. Evidently, Paul anticipated that several of physical afflictions would follow this final step of church discipline. So to anticipate these calamities were not unloving, however, because the person of the affliction was that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
So the idea is that the chastening would help to lead the erring brother to repentance and subsequently to restoration. That's what discipline's all about. I know my dad had to whip me often as a child. You know, redhead and Titus, I'm saying that now. Maybe I'm going to have to do the same with him. But I just know that when I was younger, uh, and I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful my dad disciplined me. I'm thankful that my mom disciplined me. And I'll never forget one time my dad, he whipped me and he came over and sat down next to me. He'd never done this before, but one time he did this. And I'll, I'll never forget this either. Awesome story. He came over, put his arm around me, and he said, you know, he said, you may think that I enjoy whipping you, but I don't. And he said, the reason why I do whip you is because I love you. And see, God loves us so much that when we're out of line, he has to discipline us, and he has to correct us. And that's why he uses the church to do that is that if we have a brother or sister that's out of line, that's in the fellowship, we hope that through church discipline that brings correction and restoration because we want to see someone restored, not to go away, not to go to another church and say, well, I'm going to go somewhere else if you're going to do this. No, we want to see them restored. And they may go somewhere else. They may get mad and go somewhere else. But if we don't do things right, then we ought to just not do anything right because we've got to do it according to what God's word tells us to do it and so that's why it's important so I'm I'm not saying it's easy to do I'm just saying that's what we're told to do but also to halt the spread of sin look what it says here in first Corinthians 5 6 again it says your glorying is not good know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump now why do you think Yeast is an appropriate metaphor for the presence of a sinning member in the midst of the church body. Why do you think that's a good metaphor? It grows and it expands. Exactly. Exactly. See, yeast spreads throughout the dough and influences every part of it. Sin, like yeast, will eventually spread and corrupt the congregation, like I mentioned earlier. And that's what the devil wants. SBC right now, the devil's just living it up because he knows that if he can get Christians preoccupied with problems and with division, that we can't be reaching people for Jesus. See, if we're fighting and we're squabbling against each other, we're not doing what we're called to do, and that's to take the message of Jesus to a lost and dying world. We should never be squabbling and fighting among ourselves about who gets this, who gets that, who's right, who's wrong. We always tend to squabble about that. There's much work to be done because people die every day and go to hell. And oftentimes we're squabbling about who gets this or that, and that should never be. Fourthly, is maintain the clarity of the gospel and the purity of the fellowship with Christ. See, this goal is implied by Paul's discussion of Christ as the Passover. Uh, Let's read that there again, verses 7 and 8. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sanctified for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the old, the the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, sincerity and truth. Did we, oh, I was, I'm sorry, there's one more verse. Sorry about that. The first Passover was the occasion upon which God redeemed Israel from slavery and made it a nation. Um, during the Passover, we were familiar with this story. God took the life, the firstborn of every Egyptian household, but he spread the firstborn in Israel through the blood of the sacrificial Passover lamb. That's important to recognize. So in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul stated that Christ has been sacrificed as the Passover lamb for believers. And we know that. The atonement for sin, his blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, was sufficient to past, present, and future sin. It covered all things. That he was sacrificed for us. And this is all because of his death on the cross. We have been liberated from sin. So if that's true, then to place ourselves back under sin would be a serious betrayal of the gospel. 
It would introduce an element of pollution or leaven into our relationship with Christ himself. And so this pollution is eliminated when the offending part is removed from the membership of the congregation. You hope you never have to do that. You hope you never do. Um, um, I'm familiar with stories that other pastors have shared with me of those that have chosen to possibly go into same-sex relationships or to go against what the Bible says about certain things, and then they're asked to leave. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's a hard thing to do, and people will get upset. Some people may leave. However, if sin is allowed to go on, and it's prevalent, and it's obvious, God will never honor anything where sin is left to abound. He never will. And so that's something that we have to take seriously. So, a question to ponder. Does church discipline still work, or is it just an old fuddy-duddy thing that we hear about? Or have you heard of it working? Has anybody, I'm curious, don't, don't use any names or anything like that, but has anybody ever heard of that before where a church has had to go that route? Maybe you won't share, just don't share any names about what happened or anything, but um, yeah. And it's hard. And you hope that they're restored, but sometimes that just doesn't happen. Sometimes it leads, unfortunately, to big situations where churches have, have possibly split over things like that, and you never want to see that happen either. But it's something that must be taken seriously, and it's a question to ponder about how important it is to us to do that which is right. And I don't love controversy, I mean confrontation, as much as probably everybody in here. You hope you never have to do it, but sometimes you have to. But um, when you do, you just got to remember that as long as you stick with the word, you're going to be okay. Because that's your defense, is the scriptures, and that's what you go by. I wonder if somebody else have to say. I've talked enough. <laughs> Anything? Anything that kind of caught your attention tonight or something that you've heard of that's happened before, a situation? or Yeah. Yeah. would I, you're right about that because they would see a public example of something happening which you hope it never gets past one person talking to another if it gets to the church it's really gotten too far um, because then it's public and everybody knows about it but um, our utmost prayer should be for restoration seeing somebody restored we want to see that However, you can't, and the church can't make that decision for them to want to see correction in their life. And if they choose not to, then you're only left with one thing to do. And um, it's very unfortunate, but um, I'm saying it happens a lot. But if it does come, it's an unfortunate thing to see happen. This is one hard to talk about, too. Because uh, it's really hard for the world to look at this and how that we believe about this with the scriptures to think, well, you're just being harsh. God is a loving God, but also God's a jealous God. And so if you're not, if you say you're a Christian, but you're choosing to live your own way, God's going to discipline you if you're really his. The Bible tells us he disciplines and chasteneth those whom he loveth. 
And so if you're one of his, he will get your attention one way or another. And um, I've heard of way too many stories where people have gotten away and said, God really got a hold of me. And uh, sometimes it's been through tragedy. It's been through difficult situations. But God really spoke to them through whatever may have been happening. And um, so, like I said, this isn't a really easy thing to talk about. And I'm not, I wasn't looking forward to talking about it tonight. But it's something that we as Baptists do see that the scriptures say and that we believe is biblical. wonderful and that's what a church family does when someone's had something in their life occur to step up and support them and love on them and let them know that they're loved because oftentimes people think well does anybody really care and so that's a good time to step up and help and that really speaks a lot to somebody else anything well next week we'll be talking about the Lord's Supper and what we believe about that what the scriptures say about it and then uh, this Sunday remember we're having the Lord's Supper and we're going to be honoring um, some of our men and women oh do we just men or do we have women too do you know they're all men okay that have served in the BMI Baptist Mission International Baptist Mission International have a certificate that they uh, want us to give to them. So we'll be doing that. But uh, just a weekend to remember also all of those that have given the ultimate sacrifice so that we can live free in this country. Not a perfect country by no means, but I'm thankful for the ones that laid down their life so that we can come here tonight to worship. And we can go home tonight and sleep in our own beds and have a good night of rest because some places you can't do that. But I'm thankful we can do that here. All right, let's go ahead, let's have a time of prayer, and then uh, we'll dismiss. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. Uh, we want to thank you for this privilege to be able to look into your word. Um, Father, we pray tonight that this has been a challenge for us as we've examined these things from Scripture, the biblical example that you set, and how that we're to follow that. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do, and we pray it never happens, and but at times things do happen, and uh, we just pray that we can handle them well and in love. And Father, we love you so much. Thank you once again for this privilege to stand and just to teach your word. And we want to ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.